morning. I remember the first time that I went to the Louvre Museum in Paris and really was not prepared for <laughs> how gigantic and endless that museum really is. It is literally exhausting. And I think I had given myself like <clears throat> two or three hours, you know, to do the Louvre. You need a whole damn day and you need, you need the map because man, it's endless. There are so many paintings hung right next to each other that it just seems to go on forever and ever and ever. It's sensory overload, really. You really have to chill and sit down on one of the seats and just look at a particular painting to figure out what is going on here. You can't just walk through it, breeze through it, and affect, you know, expect to be affected by by anything, really. Because that's just exhausting. Needless to say, there are gazillions of religious themed paintings of of uh, famous uh, Bible stories from the Hebrew scriptures as well as the Christian scriptures. There's another gazillion um, paintings of the Virgin Mary uh, with the baby Jesus, the, you know, the Madonna and child motif. There are tons of paintings of various saints, the life of Christ, <clears throat> etc., etc. <clears throat> well, here was a weird, weird thing that I realized the more I traveled, particularly in the south of France and then into Italy, it becomes evident to you, if you know anything about any Renaissance painters like da Vinci, Raphael, Uccello, and the list goes on, that the Italian countryside and the south of France, where France meets Italy, that all looks pretty darn familiar. It's because those painters in the Renaissance period dressed their characters in, you know, Renaissance costumes, and also they used the landscape of where they happened to be painting. Behind me right now, you really can't see it, I don't think, um, is a copy of a very famous Madonna and Child from the Renaissance period. And the chubby, cherubic <laughs> baby Jesus, <laughs> who's blonde, is sitting on his blonde mother's lap. And she's wearing, you know, typical Renaissance ladies' uh, attire. And uh, young John the Baptist, uh, also a chubby, well-fed white boy is coming over to the house to play Hot Wheels or Hungry Hippos or, I don't know, maybe maybe do something with the Easy Bake Oven. I don't know. But but they're up to something. But it's, a, it's definitely a period piece. The Virgin Mary herself is dressed like a lady of some economic means. And when we look at these paintings, you know, when we look at uh, images of mother and child on, let's say, Christmas cards, we don't think, ooh, that's weird that she's wearing Renaissance attire. No, we don't. We think that that's normal. It seems normal to us. But here, here is the bad part of that, I think. If looking at these images from our Christian past in the Renaissance idiom, if that seems normal, it's also suggesting something very different. 
It's suggesting that God acts not in the present moment, but in the distant past. The painters of whatever period you want to look at were making really kind of a profound theological statement when they put the great events uh, of our uh, Christian past on canvas. They were showing that God is acting in our world, in our familiar landscapes, in our villages, dressed in the same kind of clothing that we are wearing. And people at the time, during the Renaissance, got it. <laughs> they got the message. They understood it. They realized that what the painting was saying was that God is acting in our world right now. In fact, maybe down the street, you know, half a mile away. So when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary, for example, uh, often there's an open window in that scene and there's a glimpse of the landscape outside the actual place where the painter is painting. When the shepherds come traipsing into Bethlehem, amazingly cleaned up and smelling fresh. The stable is located just outside the city of Florence. It's the artist's way of saying to us that the Christ is being born right now, right in this moment. St. Benedict has a lot of really good advice. And one of the things that attracted me to him, you know, 38 years ago, was the fact that he's A, not clergy, because you got to keep an eye on those clergy people. They get all full of themselves, trust me, self-included. But Benedict says some really pithy things as a lay person. He knows his scriptures, another thing I really like. Benedict says, always be mindful of the presence of God. Always be mindful of the presence of God in this present moment. We read scripturally all the time, you know, fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. Fear is not really the word there. It's really a, a better translation would be awareness. Awareness of the presence of God. So the problem as we look at these old Renaissance paintings the message of the old masters, the theology, has lost its punch. And they really, they feed an illusion of ours <clears throat> that maybe help us believe mistakenly that all the really cool stuff that God used to do is all in the past. That it's just like some historical stuff done long ago in places far far from me. If you look at those paintings, literally, it seems that Christ was growing up in the Po River Valley in Italy. <laughs> nowhere, nowhere near Nazareth and nowhere near Indiana. If you look at the paintings, Jesus is carrying his cross basically through the winding streets of some really quaint, <laughs> picturesque Italian village, certainly not down Anthony Boulevard or, or Pontiac Street in Fort Wayne. Oblivio is the word Benedict uses. It doesn't mean oblivion, it means forgetfulness. What he wants to remind us is that we need to move beyond Oblivio into the present, 
the present moment. In some ways, we like keeping God at a distance and pretending that all the cool stuff God does <clears throat> is in the past, in some distant landscape somewhere. Because if we keep an awareness of God's presence around us all the time, kind of like the atmosphere in which we live and move and have our being, then, then God might maybe have an expectation for us. So it's better, better if we just keep God at a safe damn distance so we don't have to see God on our jobs or at our table or at the bus stop nursing, you know, a young child. My thinking is this. If we can pray and be inspired by an image of Jesus healing someone in the Renaissance period, then we should be able to recognize him healing someone right on our own block. If we're moved during this season of Lent by a crucifixion scene that is set in some quaint Italian village somewhere, we should also be able to recognize the Christ today dying of an overdose with a damn needle stuck in his arm behind a trap house on Broadway Street. It is not somewhere else that God's miracles are happening. It's right here. Right now. Pray with me. Mighty, gracious God. <clears throat> God of our past, our present, and our future, We come into your presence today, asking for the gift of mindfulness. Keep us out of the past. Keep us in this present moment. Strengthen our faith. Open our eyes. <clears throat> Allow us to see that right now, on the street where we live, the angel continues to appear to Mary. Shepherds continue to show up at Bethlehem. Your Christ continues to heal and transform. Jesus continues to carry his cross and to suffer and die. And that resurrection and the power of new life is right here, right now. For all of those you have sent to us, gracious God, to teach us something, to open our eyes, we thank you. Help us today to be that nurturing presence of your love in the life of someone else who needs it today. And let us preach the gospel, not with our words, but with our simple awareness that you are always here. And all we have to do is love. Amen. Have a great Wednesday. <clears throat>